Uh, the title is meant to be uh, Australia on the edge of uh, another recession. What is the strategy? Um, so, just by way of introduction, uh, I say the world economy seems to be teetering on the knife edge. The Chinese economy, as you know, is faltering. It's likely to fall into recession. There are many estimates that the gross domestic product of that economy will drop quite significantly because of the coronavirus. But more importantly for us, I think, is China is such an important uh, country for us in terms of imports and exports. We export a whole lot of minerals, including coal, remember that? Yeah. And we export a, a whole lot of other export uh, minerals to them as well. But we import a whole lot of bits and pieces of manufacturing industry, which is then introduced into production in this country. And perhaps Robin knows more about uh, that are part of it. So, because the Chinese economy is sort of frozen at the moment, they don't, they won't be able to sell us anything. They're closing down the factories, and there's a lovely TV image recently of what's called, uh, I think it's called something infrared imaging or something, and they show how across China suddenly there's not much of uh, activity taking place. So now the economy is just slowing down, slowly grinding to halt, and that's going to affect us significantly. Yeah. Yeah. The Indian economy. I come from emissions of <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I come from India, and the Indian economy is slowing down. And we have this wonderful prime minister, he's a Trump Junior, it's called uh, <laughs> <laughs> Modi, who, who's been trying to screw up the Indian economy by various means, uh, including introducing a GST without worrying about how it's done, right. uh, including freezing. Uh, and currency notes of more than uh, 500 rupees, which means nothing to you, but, uh, and sit now. I just said the Indian economy is slowing down, and uh, that's because I think, because the government there is doing crazy things at the moment, and we have a government in India by a guy called Narendra Modi, who pretends he's a uh, Trump, a Donald Trump, has the same kind of populist idea, he's got a bit of a fascist freak in him too, but that's by the way. Globalized. Sorry? Globalized. Globalized, no, <laughs> it's populist stuff. Um, the Australian economy, as you probably know, is in a very weak position at the moment because we've had a, a drought followed by bushfires, and now, of course, this thing called COVID-19 or coronavirus. So that's increased uncertainty in the whole economy. And climate change has also introduced uncertainty in the economy. As a result of all this, Business and consumer confidence is at much, is much lower levels than it used to be. And again, as people from the union movement know, wage growth has been slowing down for the past few years. And, and that, of course, means that people don't have enough income to spend, and therefore that slows down expenditures in the economy. Uh, historic lows of the interest rates. In Australia, the interest rate, the Reserve Bank just cut the interest rate to 0.5%. They hope this is going to do something to the economy. I think they're crazy. Yeah. Um, but interesting enough, the Reserve Bank governor is recommending to the government they should introduce fiscal policy. This is interesting. The Reserve Bank governor says to Mr. Morrison, hey, get off your whatever, and why don't you try and stimulate the economy to do better? I think that's unusual. And and I think Robin mentioned that even the industry groups, the AIG and, and various other groups, have been saying that the, the government should be introducing fiscal policy to stimulate the economy. So that's interesting uh, that we have this kind of combination. OK, that is all by way of introduction. Some of you might have read the newspapers uh, yesterday, which said, the day before yesterday, that the stock market has collapsed in almost a whole range of countries. I have a slide, but you can't see it, of course. Uh, the slide says something like the United States, there's an 11% drop in the S&P. Uh, the Dow Jones went down by 12%. The FTSE in Britain went down by 11%. DAX in Germany, etc., etc., went down. Uh, and the OECD in a report just came out yesterday said the world economy is at risk. And it states that the global economy is facing its greatest threat since the global financial crisis. Now, the, the, so the OECD is a very nice, good, nice conservative bunch of guys, and even they are getting a bit worried now about what's happening here. Um, 
I'm an academic, so I hate to be a little bit academic for a few seconds. Um, I define what, what is a recession. Economists have very proper definitions of lots of things, whether you like them or not. Um, a popular definition, which is what the media talks about, is they say two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth. And the gross domestic product falls one quarter and falls again in the second quarter, and that's what they call a, a recession. And in Australia since uh, the year, about 28 years ago, GDP did fall for one quarter, but it's not a recession because it didn't fall in the second quarter. That's a popular definition. It's a media definition. It's not the definition used by quote, proper economists. There's, there's a group in America called the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they define uh, the a recession, oh, I'm not here, but anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'll come back to it in a second. Um, what you find in Australia, we didn't have a recession, they claim, for 28 years. That's because we didn't have two negative uh, quarters of gross domestic product growth. But what we found after the uh, so called global financial crisis, or GFC, is that unemployment rates went up very significantly. Underutilization rates went up significantly. Significantly, long-term unemployment went up significantly. So, in my definition, and a definition which the National Bureau of Economic Research says, that would also be counted as a recession. So, technically, we didn't have a recession, but in fact, if unemployment has gone up, underutilisation rates have gone up, and long-term unemployment has gone up, I think that is a recession. People who are unemployed knew they were in a recession, they lost their jobs, they were suffering from the global financial crisis. So my definition, I've got a little diagram here which shows you what happened to uh, the labor market in terms of uh, unemployment rates and in terms of underutilization rates uh, and in terms of long-term unemployment. I've done a whole lot of work in the past on long-term unemployment. And what's interesting is that the long-term unemployment rate has been rising quite a lot, significantly since the 2008 recession, yeah. and it's still almost the same level as it was just after the 2008 recession. The long-term unemployment is people who have been unemployed for 12 months or longer. That's huge. And somewhere in a version of this paper, if I, I show you that people on New Start Alliance, some of them have been unemployed for five years or longer. These guys aren't sitting on their butts just to enjoy this wonderful new start allowance of $278 a week or whatever. <coughs> the next section of my paper talks about is Australia facing a recession? Um, Australian economy has already slowed down. It slowed down even before the bushfires and even before the drought that we had. And the impact of the virus, the COVID-19, on the Chinese economy is almost certainly lead to the Australian economy growth slowing down, but it actually tips over and becomes uh, negative for two quarters, I don't know. But clearly what's going to happen is that unemployment will increase, the underutilization rate, people on part-time work that would like to work longer hours, that's going to be increasing over time, whatever happens to the GDP for the next quarter or two quarters. Um, the OECD, um, I mentioned earlier on, has already said that the global economy is facing the greatest threat since the financial crisis. And that's, the, that's an amazing statement to make because it's something which we all should be worried about because if we go through a crisis like the GFC, then we'll have a big increase in unemployment again, a big increase in long-term unemployment, and of course a whole lot of firms and people will go bankrupt in the process. Um, if you look at uh, interest rates, there are historical levels. There are nice, today went up in Australia to 0.5%. This should make all the firms say, hey, fantastic. I can, I can invest like crazy, build another few factories, another few dams, another few uh, solar panel uh, factories or whatever. But you don't do things like that. If the economy is going down, the people are not spending money, if what the economists say, aggregate demand is too low, people are saying, things are looking pretty grim. Why should I invest in a whole lot of things which won't come to uh, fruit until another two years later? 
just because interest rates are low doesn't mean I'll waste it. I'll wait for two years and see if things are going to get better and then I shall invest in, in increasing my capacity to produce more goods and services. Um, if you look at the data, you find that household debt has been increasing for quite a long time. It's quite almost at historical uh, heights at the moment and household debt means that uh, Households are now uh, spending more than their incomes, and part of it, of course, is because wage growth has, has been slowing down for the last few years, decade, decades of expansion. So, of course, that means that they can't, uh, they don't have enough income to uh, spend during their lifetime, so they borrow for that purpose. And um, unfortunately, my friend Steve King, who's an ex-colleague of mine, I mean, you must have heard of Steve Keane, who's yes, yeah. he's, he's predicted the uh, last 10 recessions that there were uh, in the last uh, one year. Um, <laughs> and um, he makes a big thing about the fact that household debt has gone up and, and so on. But I think it's important, household debt is going up means if we had a crisis now, we'd have a huge number of increase in bankruptcies of households which would then affect the banking and financial sector because they wouldn't be able to get the money back from, from the customers. Um, I mentioned about unemployment rates and unemployment rates. Unemployment rate at the moment is, was last month, were 5.2 percent, which is about the same level as it was way back after GFC. So that's worrying, I think. It's not, it's not uh, something which we should say is, quote, as the, the some economists say they put the natural rate of unemployment. I don't think that's true. Uh, even the uh, Reserve Bank governor has been saying for some time we should do something like increase fiscal policy to try and stimulate the labor market too. Um, there's something called the underutilization rate. That's the unemployed rate plus the percentage of people who are underemployed. So if I'm uh, a casual worker and working 10 hours a week, and I tell people I prefer to work more hours than that, then I'm underemployed uh, in the, the surveys that take place. So if you add up these two numbers, the underutilization rate is something like 14%. That's very high. That's the thing which one should be concerned about now. Some of you might have heard the phrase, what is to be done? It's a famous pamphlet written some time ago. Yes. Yeah. Lenin. 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 Yeah. Exactly right. So it's the next section of my it's his 150th <laughs> birthday this year. Yeah. So the next section of my paper is called What is to be done? Uh, and I suggest a so called 10 point plan. And uh, what's, what is to be done? I say it's high time for the government to forget the budget surplus fetish. For yeah. last year, yeah. one two years, the Turkey government has been saying we must have a budget surplus. Why? And unfortunately, even the Labour Party has bought that stupid argument. Because the way that the economy runs has nothing to do with whether the budget is in surplus or not in surplus. It is how well people are doing in that society. And nobody cares anyway. Yeah. Exactly. And, and as, as far as we know, if a government has a budget deficit, it can borrow. It's one of the few people who can borrow quite easily because it will just pay it back in the future <laughs> in the never never land. It doesn't matter. It can do that. Yeah, central banks love it. <laughs> people, people who have uh, bonds in the government will also enjoy it because they, they can uh, get it at good price at that time. Okay, so it's a crazy idea. And at the moment, Mr. Morrison is backpedaling very quickly because he knows with the budget, with the bushfires and so on, he's having to spend more on repairing the system, and so we're most likely not to have budget in black, but we have a budget in red this year. He, he kept BSing about the fact that they're going to have the budget in surplus, but he's slowly backtracking now, and it looks like we won't have a budget surplus for this year. So a good excuse. <laughs> He's got an excuse, but I don't think it matters really, as I said, whether it's in surplus or not. Anyway, let me go on. What should the government do? I think it should introduce a stimulus package, like we did after the global financial yes. crisis. Australia is one of the few countries, after the crisis, which introduced stimulus measures very quickly and very significantly and tried to hit a whole range of areas where people would start spending money quickly. And I think that was the reason 
they made a stimulus payment of it was 900 and something dollars to everyone who was, who was a taxpayer. And of course, when people get some higher amount of money, $900 in their, their budget, and they've had a tight time so far, they huge household debts, they go and spend it. If they go and spend it, that means shops have more sales taking place. If shops have more sales, that means they hire more workers to look after that. That means they have to buy more things from the producers, the factories and so on. So that stimulates production in those areas too. So we say there's quote, a multiplier effect. It's a term which came about since the Keynesian economics of the 1930s. Kevin Rudd was a genius during the GFC. <laughs> I think Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan did fantastically well, but the Department of Treasury at that time had a, a guy called Bruin, um, I his first name, um, who was at Harding then too, and I think he was involved in producing the stimulus package that they had at that time. Right. They, they used a the phrase at that time that um, we should go soon and go hard. That is, if you want to try and prevent the recession, what you have to do is get a whole lot of package expenditures quickly and then start using them straight away. There are some expenditures take a long time to have its impact on the economy. But expenditures like the $900 which was made straight away has an immediate impact on the economy. The expenditures they had on school repairs and school extension buildings for I forgot the exact terms that they had, that was going to help a lot of unskilled, unemployed construction workers who would otherwise have been suffering in the crisis. So it was again helping people to get jobs immediately. That was very important. The so-called pink bats affair, which the, the, I was going to say the big coalition made a big thing about because three people died in, in the process because they hadn't been properly trained and properly qualified by the capitalist employers, not, not by the drug government. The capitalist employers didn't treat them properly, hence they died. And again, if you work in the union movement, you know there are industrial accidents taking place every time. And the CFMEU or CFWMEU nowadays is always complaining about safety conditions on, on, on the industrial sector where lots of people from the numbers die every day, every week, every month, every year. And that doesn't go into royal commissions about so-called pink bats at first. Um, I think what the government should be doing is lower income tax is to lower taxes for lower income groups, not not the top guys. Because yeah, again, right. people who, people who are going to be spending more of their income, other people are lower incomes. People at the top income groups don't spend as much of their extra income as people at the lower income groups. People at low income groups tend to spend most of the income or technical terms have a quote mar higher marginal propensity to consume. So first, my first point on my 10 point plan was to lower income taxes for lower income groups. The second is to increase public investment in green technology or renewable energy. I think they should be investing a lot more on solar panels and on solar batteries. I don't know if you know, but South Australia managed to get a Tesla battery, yeah. which made a big difference to the energy provision of electricity in, in South Australia. So there's no reason why other states cannot try something like that with the help of public investment in that area. Weather or rocks? Hang on, mate. Um, sure, the, sure. The third, the third point that I suggest is that the government should be investing in low cost, low cost housing for people who are homeless and who are low income families. So not building tower blocks in the middle of the city for rich people, but to build low cost housing for, for lower income people. So a public housing investment, which unfortunately over the past few decades, the government has been selling off its public housing and just letting private entrepreneurs to look after the housing and therefore make it more difficult and cause increasing homelessness in society. Um, my next point is invest in aged care homes in the public sector. No, so not private aged care homes, but public housing in the aged care sector. Because as some of you might have read recently, there's been a big controversy that a lot of private sector housing has been uh, essentially corrupted by the profit motive and people are not treating people properly in those homes. Uh, my next point is invest in better medical facilities in remote areas for indigenous people. 
people in the, in the indigenous people in remote areas have much lower life expectancy, poorer health, and so on. So there's no reason why a so-called rich society like Australia can't invest more in that area. Proper climate. Um, yeah, proper housing and so on would be very important too. The next point I say is an immediate payment of $2,000 to all people who are on the New Start Alliance. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a, bit, a bit like the $900 payment that uh, Wayne Swan and uh, Kevin Rudd suggested. Yeah. But this is the New Start Alliance people because they've been living essentially on a poverty line for a long time. And again, people on New Start would spend most of this $2,000, which would help uh, shops and firms and other people to increase their production and increase consumption of these commodities. Um, the next one, I think, um, I suggest again, similarly, an immediate payment of 2,000 to all volunteer firefighters who work during the bushfires. Yeah. Most, most, of these, most of these people were working as volunteers, and I think we can say thank you to them by making a payment. The next, I suggest an increase in minimum wages. At the moment, minimum wages, at least what I read about, is $19.49 an hour, yeah. or that comes to sorry, $740.80 cents per week. And I'd say to increase it at least to $20.65 an hour, which comes to $785 per week. Um, there is, at the moment, a big thing going on about submissions to the minimum wage, to the Fairway Commission about minimum wages, I'm not sure what will come of it. Like Coles and Woolworths have a plan? That's from big step. Yeah. Um, similarly, the next one I'd say is increase the new start allowance. Currently it's $278 per week to at least $375 per week. But to index it to real wages. At the moment, the uh, uh, new start allowance is just indexed that is just linked to the, uh, the CPI, the, the price index. But the price index, if everyone else's wages are going up, in real terms, people on New Start Alliance don't go, don't get on as well as the rest of the people. Um, the last ten po tenth point I have here is increase pub increased public sector wage wages of people like hospital staff, childcare centres, and staff at old age homes. Um, again, that's something because I think they are needing of, of better conditions out there. Yeah. Okay, that's that's the basically what I have to say. So in conclusion, what I've said so far is Australia is facing a crisis, major crisis. Uh, we know that uh, the gross domestic product is slowing down. It's likely, we don't know, but it'll be actually a recession, which is that uh, GDP will fall. But we already know that unemployment is likely to increase even more. Uh, Underutilisation rates are likely to increase even more and long-term unemployment is likely to increase a lot more. A global slowdown is already taking place and the Chinese economy is almost certainly going to go into recession. It's already in a bad state and we know that they've closed down a whole range of factories and installments and even things like Apple uh, mobile phones you can't buy now because the, the components come from China and so that's closing down some industries like that too. Um, I've already mentioned that the Australian drought followed by bushfires has increased uncertainty in the economic system and climate change has also affected the behaviour of people in this society and increased uncertain uncertainty and that's led to a fall in investment by firms. <coughs> Clearly said we need a major fiscal stimulus similar to that after the post-GFC uh, crisis. Uh, and I've said we should increase public investment, increase minimum wages, increase new start allowance, public sector wages, and so on. And I mentioned that one thing we should do straight away is have an in immediate increase in cash payments of about $2,000 to new start allowance people. Thank you. Yeah.